Peace on coast.
tells me what I've done It reminds me what's gone wrong When my sins are laid before me My Lord, you take them all Yes, my Lord, you take them all So if I fall and if I fail I will trust your mercies greater
so much for singing out with us. Enjoy the rest of the service. be a lot easier for Jesus or anybody to say, look, you know, this is what this says, and I won't do this because it disturbs people. I don't want to rub you the wrong way. Right. Man, Jesus was always, you know, like you pet, pet the cat, he was rubbing him backwards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't like that. That's so right. he, he was going against the grain. And, yeah. and that's okay for us too, but, but we need to do it in a way that is non-judgmental. That's right. That's loving and kind. And, and if I could say, yeah, I'm okay with you believing what you want. And Here's the amazing thing. I have been there, mm -hmm. and those have been my beliefs, but I've, my heart has transformed to understanding it in a better way. Yeah, It's okay. You can be there. But once you get on this side and you discover the guilt is gone, the fear is gone, it's more healthy, it's non-toxic, yeah. it is more gracious, it's a, I'm a better person in this path That's than right. I was in that path. Yep. And I want people to discover, as Paul says, the most excellent way. That's right. Good morning. It's good to see you today. Thank you so much. I've been uh, uh, enjoying uh, Summer at the Movies, as you have. So six weeks, wonderful that. And uh, we just concluded that last week. So give kudos to uh, Pastor Roy for a great job doing that. Let up. And... Uh, not just uh, Pastor Troy, but also the creative team. Lay Miz last week was a wonderful thing. And if you liked it, give a hand for that too, if you enjoyed that. So I think many of you did. So now we're back to regular uh, church. What does that mean? Excitement, a new series, good things are happening. But let me tell you a little bit about Suncoast. I'm Larry Bonk, I'm the lead pastor. Started the, we started Suncoast 26 years ago. It's been my joy to be the main guy. But the last six weeks, you know, I've been able to give that away a little bit and enjoy that as well. But, uh, but let me tell you what happened yesterday. Yesterday on this campus, you had a part in this, you may not realize it, but uh, 25 people got a free car wash, car vacuum, and oil change yesterday on our campus by the men of this church, uh, all because that's what we do for our community. And these are guys who are, some are executives, and you know, they're, they're not used to hard work, not like me, not like me. I mean, there's a big joke going on there anyway, but... These guys get out and they're sweaty and they're hot, but they're serving and there's a good spirit about the whole thing and people are blessed. And when we walk away from that, guess who wins? Everyone. The guys who are serving win. The, the people who have their car washed and oil changed free win. And, and we do a lot of car giveaways as well. I think we've given away a couple cars just in the last couple of weeks. So if you have a car, you're about to trade in the dealership, I want to convince you, that they probably won't give you much for it. Give it to us. And what we'll do, we'll go over it, make sure it's mechanically sound and we'll give it to someone who needs it. Because we believe our community is about helping people right around the block. We believe in other world things and other missions too, but we also believe that we cannot let the people hurt right around us. So, and if you want to give to Suncoast, we don't talk a lot about tithing or giving here. In 26 years, we've never passed the offering plate, but that doesn't mean we don't appreciate when you give. And summer's been, we've given a lot of expenses this summer. So if you think, oh, I haven't given in a long time, Go buy one of the credit card machines or write a check and put it in the box and we'd appreciate that because your gifts make it possible to change oil and give away cars and all that stuff. So it's part of what you do. So you say, I wasn't out there, but in, in, as a matter of fact, every time you participate here, we're part of a community. We all do it together. So thank you so much for that. Today, we're launching a new teaching. It's called Connections. And in this series, what we're trying to do is, and we're going to do it, not just me, but Pastor Troy and I, we're going to examine the connections in our lives. There are many, so many of us who feel alone. And that feeling is real. But the truth is, we're never alone. As we examine the Apostle Paul's teaching into the church at Philippi, we'll discover some wonderful insights into our connectivity. Today, we're going to look at the benefits of being connected with Christ. Paul uses the term united, which means connected with, fused with, bonded with. And, and key words in this series, you're going to hear them today, but also through the series, are going to be this first word, reflection. If you've been here a while, you know I'm big on the word reflection. What does it mean? What, what, what is reflection? Well, you can call it a lot of things. I, in, within reflection, is, uh, there's prayer. Within reflection, there's thinking. There's meditation. It's pausing for me at the beginning of the day. Sometimes I do a walk, and as I walk, I just say, you know, God, I don't know what comes this way today. 
but I'll make sure that I'm in the middle of where you need for me to do, what you need for me to do, where you need for me to be. You, I told you a story years ago about having some rocks in my pockets and want to throw them at a car who'd egg me. Now, the, in my moments of reflection, I empty my pockets and say, God, I don't want to carry any rocks around today to throw at anyone. I want to be a person of, of integrity. And sometimes it's in my reflection uh, that comes inspection. You know, I grew up in a church that inspected people's lives. We like to see, we want to make sure you all do the right thing. Aren't you glad that's not us? But I will tell you, it's so fun. When you come in to tell everybody what they need to do and how they need to fix their life, it's almost like being a husband. So, <laughs> sorry, there's marital counseling available. But reflection leads to inspection. I inspect my life, and God begins to shine a light on me, and I see what needs to be done, how I need to change, how I need to grow. And once I see the inspection, guess what comes next? Correction, right? And God, with his grace and the spirit of Christ in me, we begin to change some things. With correction, there's this also word, transformation. With reflection comes inspection, correction, and this transformation begins to happen. And the, the next thing that happens is connection. So reflection, inspection, connection, a correction, connection. And then what also follows is humility. I love to preach on humility. I'm probably the most humble person in the church. <laughs> See, that's the opposite of humility. But you know, when I go to preach on humility, I try to let, not let God know. I want to do it like Saturday before I preach on Sunday. Why? Because what teaches humility is humiliation. And I have many stories of humiliation. And I'll tell you one. This week recently, we were in North Carolina a couple weeks ago with the family. We do this whole family trip. We've been doing it for my, my children their entire lives. Now it's the grandchildren are involved. So it's decades of going to the same lake, the same place. And what it involves in the morning, we, we're at a house all together and we, we go across the lake to this rock. And there's one big rock and the kids jump off the rock. And it's exciting. They, they grow up and some are too timid, but then they get to the place, they jump off the rock. And then, they, then after we jump off that rock, we go to the other rock, which is smaller. And they jump off that rock, but it's got a rope swing. And I want you to know, guys, I grew up in the South with creeks and in areas where you could swing off a rope swing. I really am pretty proud of all the accomplishments in my life swinging off a rope swing. Off cliffs, I'm a guy that swings out so far I can do a flip off the end of the rope. I can dive off the end of the rope. It's pretty pretty amazing. I just, I amazed myself. <laughs> and a, a few years ago, I was up there with my grandkids. I said, I'm going to show you, uh, not grandkids, my children. Ryan, who is now, you know, well, I'll say it's 20 years ago. And I was, and I was to watch this. All kids were there way up the bank. I'm going to show them what I can do. Swing off. I mean, I'm way high in the air and I decide I'm not going to flip. I'm just going to do a great dive and I get the dive perfectly formed. And when I came down, I went, <laughs> let me do it again. That's still not as hard as it hit. When I hit so hard, flat, I remember thinking, oh, it might uh, knock the breath out of me. And I had, I end up with a bruise this big on my side. My son, Ryan, he was about 14, swam out to me. And he swam out and he said, dad, you need some help. And I looked at him and said, go away or I will drown you. I just need to suffer a little. But you know the amazing thing? I was so good at that. And in my mind, I still am. Do you know I've never done that since? Why? Because I want to keep that humiliation in my mind. It leads to humility. So how are you swinging off a rope? Not very good. You want to try it? No. What do you want to do? I just want to not do that. Why? Because I did that. I thought I was good at it. I ended up showing how bad I was. That's a lesson, humiliation. That's why I don't preach on humiliation. Because those stories happen to every pastor who wants to preach on humiliation. That comes in this week. And I have too many stories. I could, I'm not going to tell you all of them because I don't have enough time. But, but we are going to talk a little bit about humility as we go through. And that's just nothing compared to what I'll tell you. It gets worse. Are you sure? Humiliation. Let me talk to you about the scripture. Philippians says, and Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, if any... Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, 
if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion that make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of, and of, one, and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, got it? In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. I'll start with one more story. Becky's parents have been gone. Her dad's been gone for over 20 years. Out of all the men in my life that have impacted me, there's no one that's impacted me more than Frank Kraft. That's his name. And his wife, Eleanor, was a wonderful mother-in-law. People tell the stories of in-laws. I just happen to have the best in-laws that a person could have. A mentor, great man, but I love Frank. Good businessman, owned several businesses, did very well, and taught me so many things about life and entrepreneur and what it means to do this. But one day they came back, and uh, they, he loved to have his car washed. He liked his car always clean. And they came home, and I just happened to be there. And I don't know whether it was vacation or what the circumstance was, but they came home, and, and he said, I need to tell you a story. I said, what happened? He said, well, we went in town. We decided to get our car washed. And uh, I said, well, what happened? one of those car washes where you drive through and there's an attendant and then he goes away and the car goes through and you're in the car. He said, well, as soon as he walked away, turned away, he said, something bumped on the car and I thought it was coming out of the track. He said, so I, I thought, oh, my, we're in trouble. So I rolled the window down just to, to yell at him, say, he need to stop this thing. And you know, as soon as I rolled that window down, soap and water here. And, he, and Becky's mom was in the car. She got soaked. And she was like, yeah, Frank. I mean, she wasn't too happy about it. He was going, I just had to tell somebody because that's one of the dumbest things I think I've ever done. I said, well, how'd that go? He said, well, I was thinking. Reflection. I was thinking. I don't think I'm going to do that again. Reflection. What did you do this week that put the window down? that puts stuff, soapy water in your face or whatever it was, something that humiliated you or something that embarrassed you or something at the end of the day, you go, I should not have said that or I could have said it better this way. See, reflection leads to correction and I think reflection also leads to connection. Let me share two main truths with you today. Here's the first one. There are many benefits from being aware of our connection with God. You can fill in the blank if you want. Paul began to describe the benefit package we have when we're connected with God. First, let us understand what it means to be connected. To be connected means to realize that God lives in us and dwells in our lives. We enter into a more intimate connection with God. We realize he's the source of life and he has been with us all our lives. The results of this realization have immediate benefits and long-term benefits. The relationship with God is more than knowing about God. You know, knowing about God says God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Just the, the platitudes about God. He's great. He's big. He's um, omniscient. That means all-knowing. He's omnibenevolent, all-caring. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. That's what we know about God. But knowing God becomes more personal. Knowing God comes when you, you reflect and you breathe a prayer when you're in your car. Or you reflect when you're walking around the block and you realize this is going to be a busy day and I've got a lot of things to do, but God, help me to keep things in priority. Or maybe at the end of the day, before you take your last big sigh before you go to sleep and you say, God, thank you for this wonderful day. When you See, it becomes personal when you want to know him more. See, the benefit package when you get a job, you go through all the things. Well, you're going to get salary. You got a couple weeks, week, vac weeks vacation insurance or not, maybe paid sick leave, vacations, holidays, life insurance, 401k. But when we realize we're connected with God, it's not just the benefit package of all the things you get, but there's a transformation that happens. All the potential transformational benefits. And Paul begins to list all the ways that we can be changed. First thing he says, you know, if, if you have this spirit with Christ, you can be encouraged and you say, oh, I'm going to be encouraged. That means I'll never be discouraged again. No, that's not what it says. Life is full of discouragements. But realizing that you and I can be connected with God gives us a perspective that we otherwise would not have. It reminds us that our life is determined from the inside out, not from the outside in. See, I can get discouraged when I'm my source of strength. 
when it's my source of wealth, when it's my source of vision, when it's all about me. Sometimes I get into the self-pity, oh, woe is me, or I become discouraged or depressed. But let me suggest you a different way to think. Since God lives in us today, take courage. Be encouraged. We are loved. We are cherished by God. We're of great value. God lives in us, and we're intimately connected with him. You can say, but I don't feel up. I feel down. Paul says, set your mind on things above. There's a pattern of mind setting. I was talking to one of my grandkids recently, and kind of like, oh, they've got all this stuff to do and all those different things. And I remember talking to her and saying, you know, but look at the bright side. I said, are you familiar with the term, the cup's either half full or half empty? And I'm talking to her and I think, I'm gonna have a chance to talk into somebody's life. And I begin to say, if you look at the good things of life, you'll find the good things of life. If you look for the bad things of life, you'll find them. Always look for the positive. The cup is half, well, it's the cup half empty. No, it's half full. And there can be more. Be encouraged. Set your mind on things above. I, I think that's a positive way to live your life. If you hate where you live, you're at a disadvantage. And if you hate your life, you're at a disadvantage. Why? Just a few weeks ago, I came with this phrase. It's true. I walked out of a meeting with somebody, and I just, I just in my time of reflection to God, I just looked up and said, I love my life. I love my life. I love what I do. I love the fact that my wife loves me. I love my kids. I love my friends. And folks, I'm not living isolated I look around and go, yeah, I know you, and I know you, I know you, I know my friends, and you make my life better. I love the opportunity to share these deep truths, and I see the world differently today than I did when I was younger. Something happens as we grow older. It's not that we're any smarter. I just think we're wiser. We let some of the other things go. The more important things are there for us. So uh, set your mind on things above. You can set a pattern of, of mind setting. What is your mindset? You can ask yourself that. But when we take our focus off us and put our minds on things above, I think things change. So I, even at Suncoast, I'm not really interested in Suncoast being the best church in town or saying those churches are not as good as we are, we're better. Let me tell you, folks, I think around this community, people are doing the best they can with what they know. But here's what I do know. If we can just raise the tide, all the boats are lifted. If we can help people become better, it's okay if every church gets better. They should. We need to be about community and unity. And, and we all can't see it the same way. I understand that. But we still don't have to be naughty at each other or nasty at each other. Let's just, we're all on the same team. You're doing the best you can. I'm gonna cheer for you. When you're up, let's cheer for them. But when we take our focus off of us and set our minds on greater things, it takes us to a different focus. I had a friend of mine who told me he had a dream, a real dream. He said, uh, he said I won a prize. He said, a big prize. I didn't know what it was. They said, but come on in. We're going to give you a big prize. He's all excited in his dream. He said, I had to go through this door. It's a small door. And he said, I went inside and it was a small room. And it was just, it was all cramped. He said, before long, I began, I began to hyperventilate. He said, I, I got to get out of here. I don't care what the price is. It's not worth it. I am having a claustrophobic attack. And he had anxiety. And I mean, before, he said, when I woke up, he said, my heart was just pounding. He said, I, I, I got up and walked around. and said, I got to let that go. I said, what was the price? He said, just getting out of the room. He said, I couldn't go back to sleep. And I began to think, I wonder how amazing it is that our minds can think of something and put us into cardiac arrest. Our mental state can make our hearts race even when our bodies are lying down. Our mental state most often is adjusted by reflection, pausing, calming, reminding, praying, connecting, resetting our minds to God. That's why the apostle Paul says, set your minds on things above when our world possesses us and drives us to discouragement and puts us in a panic attack. Can it be helped with a matter of perspective? I think it can. What does it take for us to put aside today's frustrations or today's worries? Do you know they say that 90% of the things we worry about really never happen? 
but we waste so much mental energy. With reflection, we realize God is reality and he's with us. We realize that God loves us even when other people only tolerate us. God sees us as a value. The result of reflection, for me, it brings correction. Folks, I grew up in an in a evangelical church my whole life in the Deep South, and I was told from the very beginning I was a dirty, rotten sinner. And I remember just thinking, I am a dirty, rotten sinner. You gotta confess that I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Well, if you confess that, then you, know, then you can believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and this whole four points of salvation, and, and I actually taught it. I mean, evangelism explosion. I was a teacher within it. I not only do it, I know it. And then one day, it seems like the world shifted. How did it shift after time reflection? Took about a year. I heard God say, you are my child and you're not a dirty rotten sinner. I always have loved you, always will love you and knock that stuff off. Folks, that changes your life when you wake up in the morning and go, God loves me. I'm his kid. I'm not a bad person. I do some dumb things, especially rope swinging. I mean, I, I've done some really foolish things, but I'm his child and he loves me. And what a burden has been lifted because of simple reflection. And I begin to search the scriptures and realize some of that stuff is not necessarily true that we've been taught. I used to saw that one more thing where Jesus was petting the cat. He was rubbing the cat the wrong way. And some of the stuff I've been taught Sometimes it's just not, it's been, it's been so smooth, but Jesus, no, it's got to go the other direction. And when I find and discover it, I find my life is better. See, what's weighing on you today? What's damaging us today? Reflection brings correction, but sometimes I need to pause in my reflection and say, God, I need to know that you're there. See, I'm not a dirty, rotten sinner. God has lived in me since I was a child. As a matter of fact, I think every breath I breathe is from God. Every heartbeat that I have is from God. The blood that's within me, the Hebrew word is nephesh. It means everything about me being alive is God alive in me. And I think that's what I understand to be. I think there's always been a, a time where God has loved us. But when I surrender my issues to God and I, my discouragement, I see things as hopeless. When my eyes are open again, I rejoice in his presence. So let me ask you, what's weighing you down today? Let me tell you what's weighing some people down. The presidential election. Folks, I, my mother turns 98 tomorrow. 98. I'm going to go have lunch with her. I said, Mom, what about the election? What do you think? She goes, Larry, I lived through a lot of presidents. I just hope I live through the next one. I don't care who it is. She said, none of them have, have changed my life. I go, okay. So why do we get all so upset? All excited, all passionate. And some people get in just dismay because they think, this party's gonna win or that party's gonna win. I will tell you today, I serve a different kingdom. And it doesn't matter who's in Washington to me because that person doesn't live in my heart and that's the one I follow. Now, do I have personal preferences? Yes, I do, just like you do, and it's okay. But just don't let it take you to the levels of, of stress and anxiety. Some people are anxiety today about their mortgage or their car payments or their career or their business. They're stressed. Some are divorced and you feel stressed about that. Some are into the multiple marriage failures. Some of you are asking the question, are your, are your kids not stable? And some of you are concerned because your kids' rooms look like a stable. <laughs> I mean, are you a single parent? Are, do you have addictive behavior? Are you carrying a past full of failure? Or just the fear, I'm gonna do the same failure again. I have great news for you today. God loves you and wants you to surrender your fears to him. Being encouraged is the byproduct of a connection with God. Reflection leads to connection. We don't have to look at the world and be depressed. We can look at society and realize that God, despite what we see, God still loves the world. Becky and I have been married for 48 and a half years. It's a long time. Early in our marriage, we made this agreement. We agreed that now, maybe you don't like this or not, but it's what we agreed, that I would make all the major decisions and she would make all the minor decisions. And people say, well, how's that working for you? I say, well, it's a pretty good arrangement. So far in 48 years, I've never had to make a major decision. <laughs> uh, so it all seems to be working pretty good. 
But I will tell you, the major decision in your life today is a simple recognition that God wants to connect with you. He's the source of life. He's here. You've always been God's child. That's a big decision. God is with me. My connection with God used to be, oh, God, come to me. Oh, God, come and forgive me. Come and do all this stuff for me. Now my prayer is you are here. May my life be open to all the areas of my life that you're touching. May the eyes of my heart be open to your presence always within. Paul keeps asking questions. Are you encouraged? The question to continue, do you have any comfort from his love? What is comfort? It's a healing term. You know, are you wounded? Are you damaged? Is your psyche broken? It's the realization that we're connected with God. We begin to understand when we celebrate our oneness, there's a comfort that follows. So what's Paul offering? You can be encouraged today because God loves you. And no matter what damage has been done to you, you can find some comfort in this life. You can find some healing with your connection with God. Paul says, do you enjoy any fellowship with the Spirit? What does that mean? Are you connected with him? We're not alone. We're not alone. We live with him. I love the French philosopher and mathematician, Blaise Pascal. He said it this way. I'm going to give you this quote, and I'm going to tell you, I modified it a little bit. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created being, but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. I think that's a good statement for a mathematician. I'm a theologian. I would modify that statement to say, there's not a God-shaped vacuum in my heart. I'd say this. There's a God-shaped presence in your heart that's always been there. You just need to see it and experience it. And you'll find that to reflection and connection. The Spirit of God is not only personal to me, but that reflection helps me to understand I'm within community. Paul continues to ask these questions. Do you have any tenderness or compassion? Are you encouraged? Are you comfort? Do you have fellowship? Has your heart been changed? Nothing has transformed my life any more than the realization that God loves me. That's it. Pastor, is, is it comp it's not complicated. God loves me, and I want to lean into that. I want to live into that. I want to make him proud of me. Not to brag on anything I do, but just because I want him to know I get it, and I want his heart to be on my heart. I love it when a tough guy discovers God has turned tenderhearted. You know, I used to be a tough guy. My kids and their young say, oh, dad never cries. Not true anymore. As I've grown older, my heart is softer. I see babies and just get all gushy. I mean, I see people going through wonderful things and I just celebrate with them. I see people going through difficult things and my heart hurts for them. And I think it's what's changed. I think my heart has been transformed to where it looks more like God's heart. Then Paul goes through all these things. He said, you know, if you do all these things and make my joy complete, be who you're supposed to be. See, it's not about me today, but it's about God in me. It's not about you, but it's God in you. Let me pray for you. Thank you, God, for all the good things in our lives. Thank you for the presence of Christ that is ours. My prayer for my friends, my community, this congregation, those who are watching online, that they would sense the very presence of God today. The love would so overwhelm them that they pause and reflect and make this affirmation. I am a child of God, and he loves me. That is a game changer. Bless my friends that they may know the full joy of the Spirit of Christ in their lives, we pray in your name. Amen. Would you stand, please? I'm going to tell you a story in closing. I've been reflecting because August 4th is coming. August 4th, uh, excuse me, August 24th, 2002, 22 years ago, Hurricane Andrew hit Homestead, Florida. Remember that? I remember that. Oh, that was a day. I called my cousin who lived in Homestead. And I call him, you know, sorry, deep south, cuz. His name is Paul. Paul, what's going on? I said, how are you? He said, oh, man, the storm hit us. He said, but we're okay. I said, do you need anything? I hear it's just devastation. I was the first morning after. He said, no, I think we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. I said, okay, let me know if I can help you. He hung up. Less than an hour later, the phone called back. And it was his wife. She was on the phone. She happened to be a Becky's very good friend. And she said, Larry. I said, yeah. She said, uh, we need help. I don't know what he was saying. 
The banks are destroyed. The Kmart's gone. The grocery stores are gone. We have no, no electricity. We need everything. Within 48 hours, I went to my church community, and the church responded. I had a van loaded full of food and cell phones and generators, ice, gasoline. And, and I, I drove down there, first responder, and spent a week in Homestead trying to help those people, and it was really terrible. Later on, though, after it's all over, I mock my cousin because he's like my best friend. Oh, you need any help? Oh, no, I'm fine. You know what I, I say? So typically male, right? But I'm so glad there's this other side that says, no, we're in dire need. We need help. Today, as I think about my connection with God, I'm reminded in many days, in many ways, I naively say, God, no, I'm okay. But he is the source of life. He's the source of hope. He's the one can fill your life and mine with purpose and joy. So let me ask you today, in your connection with him, you need any help? Absolutely. So how do we do that? Pause, reflect, open your life to him, and remember these words, God loves you, and so do I. God bless. Thanks for coming today.